Welcome to the book table from Backroom Whispering. This episode is the first of our Writer's Nook episodes. They used to be called Nanosodes because we originally were talking about NaNoWriMo, National Novel Writing Month, but Nanosodes expanded beyond that and people were confused about the meaning. So we love the name Writer's Nook because we like to imagine going into a cozy nook in a library with some coffee and talking about writing. I'm Dorothy, and today we'll be talking to a new correspondent, Rinska, who is a talented author from the Netherlands. Hi, how are you? Hello, everybody. I'm Rinska Verberg from Utrecht, the Netherlands, and I'm great. Thank you. How are you, Dorothy? I'm okay. We are working on a time difference here, but we are both awake, so it's all good. Yes. <laughs> That's the, the main thing, that we're both awake and alert and ready to talk about books. Yay! Yeah, um, so today our topic is right brain versus left brain and how that relates to writing. Of course, writing involves both creative and logistical commercial efforts, um, but how can a writer achieve a balance without going too far in one direction? So to prepare for this episode, she sent me this wonderful YouTube video by Ian McGilchrist called The Divided oh, Brain. You um, looked at it. Right? I did. I watched yeah. it. Um, and we'll also link to it in the episode description so that our listeners can watch it as well. Um, but we'll mostly be talking about how that relates to writing. Uh, so did you have anything you wanted to start out with? Yeah, I thought it'd be uh, handy to just give a short description of my background as a writer and where I come from. Um, I was in, enrolled in art school. Um, it's the Utrecht School of the Arts and my official like degree is in um, writing for performance and then the specialization writing prose and poetry. Um, so that's my background and that was, I could say, um, a quick explanation that, could, that was more on the right side, right brain side of the spectrum. And that's to say um, a lot of a focus on associative exercises and getting in touch with your intuitive brain, your um, sort of a broad expanding awareness and how to translate that into your unique voice and creativity. And I was not at all trained in the commercial, more commercial and sort of rational planning kinds of uh, sides of writing. So now I've been practicing for over 10 years as a writing coach and writer. I've just finished my first uh, novel, uh, like to a degree that I think I can send it out to publishers. Dorothy's read it, which I really appreciate very much. And um, so now this is something that I encounter a lot. Like, okay, it's time to tap into the more sort of, I call it left brain, although it's a simplification, but sort of more focused efforts of selling this book, setting myself targets, planning a new one, etc. So that's where I stand, and that's what I'm struggling with right now. And so I was also really curious what your, what your situation is in that respect. Yeah, so I think that... It's it's really interesting that the two of us ended up talking about this topic because my education was actually in business. Um, I did not take a single writing or creative course in college. I had uh, basically tested out of... <laughs> I, I had an, an AP in high school and that got me out of writing in college, so I did not have to do it. Um, I did not What's do it. What's an AP? Um, it's, Sorry. So, no, it's uh, advanced placement, so it's like a college-level course that you take in high school, and then if you pass a test, um, uh, it, it, right. ca yep. it counts for college credit. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, so I didn't even take writing in college. I just took all um, my degree is a bachelor's of business administration in marketing so it's all about how can we make people buy stuff and just not not very creative not very intuitive just very okay look at these statistics look at these how you know do x and y will happen um so i think it's super cool that we have such different backgrounds and that we can talk about this from different perspectives and how is that for you now as a creative person because you're obviously dipping your toe into the pond of creative uh, writing creating um any thoughts on that any experiences with that so far or is that not where you're at already just yet i think i've done pretty well for myself um surrounding myself with creative friends and family um part of the reason that i helped create backroom whispering and I join all these Facebook groups and I, I, I try to bring people together so that we can all work with each other's strengths and weaknesses. So obviously, one of my weaknesses is staring at a blank piece of paper and nothing happens, whereas some of my other friends, some other people in the group, 
they can stare at, they can turn a blank piece of paper into this ridiculous crazy amazing detailed art and then not know what to do with it whereas i can take it and figure out what to do with it yeah exactly well i thought it might also be helpful to our listeners to quickly reiterate uh what the video says exactly what our sort of starting point for this discussion is um since the video is about is about the 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 two sides of the brain the right and the left brain but what he what e mcgillchrist the author and the psychiatrist that has put a lot of thought into that uh is basically saying that there's no that the sort of simplified diversion in the brain between the rational is the left side, the creative is the right side, is not correct. That we use both halves for both processes. It's just that the one half is more associated, which is the right half, is more associated with uh, broad, expanding awareness, um, the associative, the, the intuitive, the um, a world, a, wor- a view of the world that in which you are aware that you can never know it to a finite state, whereas the left is more of a simplif- simplified version of the world. It's ultimately lifeless. It's more like emble- emblemata, emblemata, I don't know how to pronounce that in, in uh, English, but it's um, sort of images of the world instead of the objects themselves. It's and like it's... labeling things and putting them in boxes. Exactly. Thank you, Dorothy. <laughs> Sometimes I get confused with the English. Oh, well, I don't quite... know the real word, but I can talk about putting things in boxes. <laughs> exactly. So that's more, the left brain is more precise for to um, uh, describe the world in, in labels, in putting it into boxes with the express purpose uh, to, to get things done, to really take spe- specific actions to meet specific goals. And uh, so that's the base, if that's the base we're talking from, then like I explained earlier, I was trained very well to get in touch with my like right brain side and not at all to uh, to come at the writing process more from a, like a left brain uh, perspective or left brain approach. Um, so, so that's just to give a general background to the discussion so people actually know <laughs> what they're listening to when I'm talking about right brain, left brain, etc. Absolutely. So yeah, like we talked about in our backgrounds, obviously she's more intuitive right brain and I'm more rational left brain just in terms of what we've had in class. But of course, both of us have to, have to exercise both sides. Um, and we kind of worked on this together when we were looking at her book that is amazing that I hope you can all read very, very soon, but just talking about how it would be advertised, how, what sort of buzzwords we would use to sell it. Um, it even goes as far as what publishers she should send it to because some of them go for different genres and all that. Um, so they do really depend on each other. You can't just create in a void or just rationalize without creativity absolutely and even it even in the writing process itself they absolutely rely on each other because um that's so fascinating to me i like i said i've also worked as a writing coach just aside from being a writer uh for over 10 years and it's fascinating to see how different people approach the writing process um because if you are working from books and methods uh, that help you write they will almost invariably uh, come at the writing process from a, let's say, le- left brain approach. So they'll give you neat exercises that you can do, and also they will teach you how to work from a, a synopsis and a treatment and sort of get a general arc going, then break it up into smaller pieces, break that up into yet smaller pieces, and then sort of fill in the blanks. And um, uh, there's nothing wrong with that at all but what i see happening is that a lot of people especially in today's market where for example um trilogies are popular since trilogies are a built-in market for book two and three so people are actively sort of planning a trilogy without asking themselves um does this innately ask to be a trilogy you know what i mean Mm -hmm. does it actually fit is this the inherent quality of this creative, um, yeah, sort of object? But that's the way I view it. It's like I bring something into life, and it's this uh, autonomous creative object 
and it has a voice and it has a a, a sort of a need to be told or a need to be heard and that's not my agenda that's its own agenda and I, I think that if you only um, approach it from like an external point of view okay what am I gonna do with this how am I gonna market it how am I gonna write it how am I gonna sort of summarize it and then break it down into scenes and then write those scenes then you sort of don't listen to the inherent voice of the thing if that makes any sense it, it absolutely does but what about the opposite problem what about when you're so caught up in what the characters and the plot want to do that you don't think about uh, selling it. I mean, it, it's a it's kind of a reality that if you want to be a writer, you do have to think about selling it. So have you had people with the opposite problem who are just all creative and no rational? Well, I yeah, I, well, I, that's two, there's two levels to that as well, because there's the one level is that um, or the problem manifests at two levels, let's say. Um, there's the one thing where people think they write, um, I don't know, is publishable, publishable, is that a word in English? It is now. Okay, that, there are, that's the one category, is the people that think they write publishable content, whereas what they're actually doing is, that's a step, um, that's a presiding step in a creative process where they're actually just externalizing things within themselves to um, and expressing things to to process them so it's it's more like a, almost a therapeutic process for them mm -hmm. and um, that's got nothing to do with what I would as an outsider would like to read you know mm -hmm. it might be it might be life-saving for you and it might be that boring to me mm -hmm. that's absolutely valid I mean it that doesn't make it any less valid for you to write it and it make doesn't make it any less for any more compelling for me to want to read it mm -hmm. you know what I mean so there's yes. that that's that's one point and then the other category is people like you said people that can write decent stuff but they they're just not able to um, sort of yeah but like plotting is a, is a really good subject um, because I saw your efforts and other people's efforts on the um, the audio fiction series that you're about to create which I think is phenomenal um, and that's very let's say, left-brained, right? I mean, there's a canon, there's a world, there's a plot description, an arc, and then you get into the into the episodes. Mm -hmm. I think for a series like that, especially if you write it with multiple people, that's a really sensible approach. And I see a lot of people, and I have seen a lot of people who cannot do that at all. I'm one of those people. So, <laughs> or I was one of those people for the longest time. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to just go on and on and on about myself. Yeah, go for it. Okay, actually, I'm actually one of those people uh, because when I just got out of school, um, I, I I had this huge problem that I could I could sort of visualize things that came from a deep creative place and were really profoundly interesting, but then I didn't know what to do with them. So I had a scene on on paper, and my teachers would be like, "Ah, oh, it's so interesting. Try to get deeper into it. Try to figure out what it means," and then. I wouldn't know what it meant, so I just go like, okay, so he's this guy, and he's okay, so this is his problem or whatever. So you know, uh, writing techniques like, okay, he has a dilemma, and he goes to do things, and he meets with aversion, blah blah blah, mm -hmm. sort of standard stuff, and then it would become that it would it would die. So I was not able to um, mix with those two. And that's what I see a lot with the really with people who are really in touch with the the creative associative side. So once they start to make a story out of it, you really need that sort of planning capability as well. And if you don't have it, then it's yeah, it's it, either you either you go about it in a really technical sort of mechanical way and it's really boring, or it's just okay, it's just chaos. So that. Um... So what we were talking about earlier, the fiction podcast, with which we are so excited to start recording soon, uh, Picera, which is going to be a production of Backroom Whispering, um, I really jumped on that mechanical, logistical aspect. Like the, the canon that she's referring to, we actually have this massive document where we say the names of the towns, the names of the characters, their histories... Uh, their attitudes, just to make sure that it all stays consistent from episode one to episode 50 of the podcast. And I 
jumped on that and I grabbed that and ran with it because I did not want to be part of something that ends up getting messy and changing a character's name or, oh, is this person this guy's father or that guy's father? Like, nope. Exactly. It needs to stay organized. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you're clearly very in touch with your sort of left brain side to the creative process. But if I could actually write an episode, it would probably be very uh, formulaic. It would be very, okay, these are our characters. This is a problem. This is how they solve it. The end. Yeah, and there's nothing wrong with that's what I, I want to reiterate that there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that um, you want to find that sort of the sweet spot where you can allow things to happen a little bit as well. Mm -hmm. So let's say you're writing that scene and they're in a back alley and it's dark and, and whatever, and you're visualizing them standing there and suddenly one of them sees something lying in the street on the cobbles stones. I see it right now. It's like it's a ring. Mm -hmm. I don't know where this where is this ring coming from. I don't know. It's coming from my brain right now. Do I do something with it? Do I do I bend over and pick it up, or do I do I just uh, you know ignore it because it's not in the summary? That's a good you know because you can feel that the moment I bring that up, there's a spark there. Like if you're listening to this podcast, you're probably like pick up the ring, <laughs> and that's that um, that imminent sense of like ah. Uh, an um, the unpredictable or the the adventurous or the mm. that's creativity and if you edit that out completely then i think in my personal experience you cannot really um it doesn't it it doesn't you don't get the spark mm -hmm. so but it can be really minor it doesn't have to alter the course of the story it can just be the small like when you created the towns in the in the in the canon you know for picera mm -hmm. did you never uh, catch yourself getting carried away or like oh yeah and they have this type of roofing because that's cool and you know did you never catch yourself you know um well i may or may not have drawn a map of one of the cities and put like a poor neighborhood and put some slums and just drawn a little star and say this is where the gangs hang out like we haven't talked about gangs in the script i just i, I was like oh what happens in this section of the city Probably exactly. gangs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, why not? You know? And so that's the fun. And uh, that's the, the spark. What I call just call the spark. And I think that you absolutely have that. You cannot... Um, you wouldn't want to be involved in this if you didn't have that longing to have that sort of adventure, creative adventure happening to you in your brain. That's what I think. I'm just sneaky about it, though, because then I take that map and I show it to the people who are actually doing the writing, and they'll be like, oh, there's gangs there, and, and then they'll take that and do something with it. <laughs> yeah, but it's actually your creation. So um, I'm not advocating that everybody should just, you know, um, move to their favorite music and like I had to do in school, which was horrible. <laughs> I write, from my, write the experience from my left knee. I literally had to do that. What? <laughs> yes. Yeah, we, we were told to move to, I don't know, classical music, beautiful music like Shostakovich or something, and then um, write, write from our left knee, or write, or just form sounds that just organically our body wanted to express. It was really vague, So what, we all hated what, that. What did yeah. your left knee do? Um, well, my left knee, that was, that was the tricky part, because actually my left knee wasn't doing all that much. So you had to come up with something, but you had to then make it sound very creative and organic, which is a very left-brained enterprise. So that was so super counter counterproductive to have us do that. And we all, we were all like teenagers, we were all protesting that and hating that subject. So that's not a good example, but um, it, it, it is a good, it is a really interesting um uh, cr crossroads, I think, the, the, what we're, we were just discussing about your uh, writing gangs into Picera is, that's what I meant earlier with the sweet spot. You have to, um, you have to be open to what your left knee is trying to say, and you also have to be open to, um, what the map of the city looks like and keeping it consistent. So that's my main point, I think, um, that you have to be, uh, in touch with both. And you cannot be in touch with both if you don't know how to get there. So I would, if I were your writing coach, I'd advise you to go there. 
what, just even if just once, um, just so you can come back and have that experience and just find your own balance. All right, so you heard it here first. If gangs ever show up in Pisera, it's my left knee's fault. It's Dorothy. <laughs> it was all Dorothy, guys. <laughs> no, but um, but that's that's something I also um uh, thought about a lot when we prepared for this discussion, and that I uh, thought was maybe interesting to say in the light of maybe people writing um, that are listening to this or aspiring writers, is that um, it's really an individual thing how those two um, two things intertwine in your brain. Like I uh, talked about with me, they for the longest they didn't. I could either be in like creative la la land and sort of come up with things my left knee was trying to say, mm-hmm. and um, and and they were good. I mean, I have a good grasp of language, obviously, and good technique, so I could make that sound really interesting. But I didn't know what it was about. And then when I sort of zoomed out all the way and had sort of like a, a helicopter view and was like, okay, let's, you know, let's pick a plot. So almost pick a plot <laughs> mm-hmm. and, uh, and put that on there and just shove that scene in somewhere and, uh, and make, um, make the whole thing, yeah, make it happen because I want it to happen, not because it wants to happen. Mm-hmm. You feel that. It sort of starts resisting you. It starts not being alive, not going where you wanted to go. And to me, that's really vital. And also in, in books that have been written where I could say, I could see that they did not want to be written that way. I had it a little bit in Divergent. I don't know if you read those books. I did, yeah. I think I see that as like partly really create, there's obviously a new, it's obviously a, a genre thing like, okay, let's write a dystopian trilogy Mm -hmm. the female protagonist blah blah but there's also like a really fresh and nice take on it which i liked and then there's also huge parts of it where it's really formulaic and where i can just see it this is not alive this is not um this is there because she thought okay i need this here (laughs) and uh yeah so you you have to be um really accountable to your story. That's my main. Yeah, there was something that we discussed in book club lately. I think it was Storm Dancer by Jay Kristoff. Um, have you read it? Uh, no, sorry. I, didn't I don't, I to don't it recommend it. <laughs> oh, okay. I didn't um, want any spoilers for when I, if I was going to go and go ahead and write it and read it. So. Okay. I, I don't think, I'm pretty sure this isn't a spoiler. Um, but there is, there is a love triangle. And yeah. it really Obviously. feels forced. It really feels like he was looking at a list of things that had to be included. Like like you're looking at a recipe for cookies and it says, okay, eggs. He said, okay, love triangle. And he yeah. just made it happen. And yeah. it, all exactly. of us in the discussion, we were like, why? Yeah. This, this isn't natural. <laughs> exactly. And the, the I think the one of the art forms, especially of formulaic, or more for like genre books is, yeah, uh, you know, uh, putting in that element because you need it because it's a genre element that you, well, that's obviously part of that specific mm-hmm. uh, or a part of the appeal to your potential readers. But then you sort of let that all go and and ask your left knee, um, <laughs> okay, so how should this this particular love tri- triangle in this particular book, uh, how should it? feel what should it be about how what should it look like Mm -hmm. and then if you really get in touch with that then you can actually make that really organic and um really uh yeah urgent but that's not a word in english that you would use we use urgency a lot that's really like meaningful um Mm -hmm. profound um yeah it uh, urgent means it it had to be there you read it and you're like, mm-hmm. yeah, this has to be in this book because this is this book. This is the the, the internal logic of this book, the internal mm-hmm. beating heart of this book. And uh, the, the, the big art, I think, of writing is um, to, to continuously take a step back and see if there are any parts that are not the beating heart of the book and keep and take them out. And that's, I mean, I'm not, uh, I'm not by no means an expert at that because... Uh, the first or third or second or tenth version of my novel, 
I, I was still like, okay, okay, bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. Um, yeah, this is genuine. Okay, bullshit, 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 <laughs> bullshit. Okay, yeah, this is genuine. And and sometimes I needed uh, outside perspectives to that, to my friends telling me that something was bullshit because, um, because it's really hard. It's I'm not saying that uh, finding that balance is uh, is an easy thing to do, and it only comes with practice. That's one thing, one aspect. It it, it comes with a lot of practice, and also. Uh, like I said, it comes with knowing both sides. So I think, like, for example, in your case, I'm not picking on you, but I'm just picking you because I'm talking to you. Mm-hmm. But, uh, like, I think, okay, that left side thing, that rational planning thing, yeah, you got that down. Um, you would probably benefit really, benefit a lot as a writer from doing exercises, exercises, sorry, to, um, to uh, stimulate the other process Mm -hmm. and then sort of come back to it and just practice and see how those two in your brain how those two interact but isn't there something left brain about okay at 3 30 i'm gonna sit down and practice being creative uh not necessarily um there it's 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 weird because you would think so but what i in my experience at least um i sit down like rain or shine i sit down and i'm like okay even so, going to so far as to say I'm not gonna get up before I wrote like thousand a thousand words, or if I have a really bad day, five hundred words. Mm-hmm. That's fine. Um, you can uh, give yourself some len- leniency for hard days. I mean, I'm all for that. But um, so you sit there and you have this empty page and you have this word count that you have currently zero words of, mm-hmm. um, and then you just um, if you really genuinely didn't know what to write like I would yeah what I just did I would just visualize okay I know I want a scene for example my next book it opens with a scene of her um tied up in the in the back of a car Ooh. and she's like waking up and she's like okay how did I get here and I just I'll just I know I want that scene and instead of see I could go about it two ways I could uh go about it like left brain okay Mm -hmm. what's who's this book for uh, what's the tone of this book? Do I want it in, um, I don't know how you say that in, in English, um, third-person perspective mm-hmm. or first yeah. person? Is that a word? Is that yeah, a thing? Yeah, that's, that's it. That's what we say. Okay. So um, you could start like a really left brain in a really left brain way. Um, do I want this in a third-person perspective or a first-person perspective? What sort of tone do I want? Do I want the scene to be uh, a setup or a prologue or a big reveal? Mm. Um Blah blah blah. What she and I could also go about it really like right brain, like visualize how she lays there. Um, I just sort of visualizing her and then sort of following her lead and mm. seeing what she's gonna do. Is she gonna try and break free, or is she gonna is she gonna check if she's been raped? How is she gonna check? Her hands are tied. Um, how does she feel? Mm. How, you know, um, does she have memories from last night? Like right now, I'm getting this hunch. Oh, she, a memory comes back to her. What memory? Mm. And then I follow that, and then I have that, and then it, it's blah blah blah, and I can go on for like ten pages. And the next day, I'll, I'll come back to it, and I'm thinking, okay, but what's this about? And then that's more left brain, because I'm thinking, okay, I cannot open this book with ten pages of memories. So where am I going? Mm. Is that is that? Yeah, all? that's awesome. Sense? That's that's a lot. Yeah. Uh, a lot of really neat things to think about. I'm going to be thinking about this all day. Oh, wow. I'm so, gl- I'm so glad I made your day a little bit more interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I spend a lot of time thinking about this stuff, but I'm never sure if it makes any sense to anyone but me. So Yeah, <laughs> so definitely. Cool. <laughs> and uh, so what, what struck you about that? What, what's the thing that make, that triggers you? I just identified very strongly when you were saying all of the more left brain approaches and that made me realize that it wouldn't be that I mean sure I might have to go back and edit it like you said but it it is definitely possible for me as someone who identifies more left brain um to go to take deliberately to plan to take the creative approach and if you if you had said that before this conversation I would be like but that's still planning that's still rational but it it makes more sense now 
Okay, that's cool. Yeah. Because yeah, it, it does it, it it does take a bit of um, uh, conscious effort, especially if it's not your go-to approach mm -hmm. to try and do it. And you could, I mean, you could do it as an exercise, and then the next day you could delete all, all that you wrote the, the, the day before because you don't like it. But at least you are giving what we were taught in art school, which I think is valid to an extent. Uh, like, I'm trying to make this whole discussion not about either or, because I think it's both, both have their merits, mm -hmm. obviously. But what we were taught is that no genuine art can come from just that planning side. So you really... The, all the things that really have um, uh, a hook, we call it a hook, mm -hmm. because it, it hooks into your brain somehow. It's not just from your, oh, I'm thinking of this and I'm thinking of that, and it's never really about me and it's safe and it's just, you know, I can take it or leave it pretty much. Um, it's This is really a way to get it. This is not just a way to get into your creative, um, into sort of a meaningfulness creatively, but also personally. Mm -hmm. You'll discover, like, I discovered that my whole book was really about me, and I only saw it once I finished it mm -hmm. because I allowed it, I allowed that sort of um, that level of meaningfulness to seep into the book because I, I, I opened that channel, so, so to speak. So, in my view, that's the only way you can really make something genuinely interesting. If there's at least a little bit, and for a lot of people that will be automatic, you know, they'll be planning, they'll be drawing maps, they'll be making story arcs, and all those little details, all those rings on the on the on the cobblestones, they will just present themselves, mm -hmm. and they won't even be aware that they're engaging their right brain, so to speak. But for some people, that's harder. That's they they are all about the planning, and then um, yeah, then they might benefit from some. Conscious effort <laughs> to be unconscious, to be subconscious. Yeah. All right. Well, we're actually getting a little bit long. So, is there any uh, closing remarks or anything that you wanted to add? Or mm, let's see, closing remarks. <laughs> um, what I would like to uh, instill most into anybody listening and thinking, okay, that sounds great, but how? How can I do that? Like you thought, like mm -hmm. how can I consciously make an effort to to do that, and how can I sort of channel that? Um, is that there are lots of books available, like The Artist's Way and uh, Writing Down the Bones, all the classics about triggering the subconscious. That's really what we're talking about: triggering, triggering the creative subconscious and the creative, like right brain part of the writing process by all these wonderful exercises that are on the, in there. And anybody can really, I mean, don't be afraid of um, what you'll encounter. Don't be afraid like, oh, it's gonna be, it's gonna be messy or it's gonna be a chaos and I'll have to sift through it and look for, you know, look for the story because that's the only way that you'll actually find the story in the, in the first place. So that would be my advice. Awesome. Don't be afraid, yeah. That would be my closing statement. Don't be afraid to, sift, to get all the rubble out and then sift through it. Instead of being so afraid of the rubble that you'll just stay on the beaten path and never allow yourself to make a mess, because messes are awesome. So will you send me a couple links to your favorite books, and we'll put those in the uh, episode description along with that um, Ian McGilchrist video so that our listeners can explore more on this topic, because it's a super interesting topic. Absolutely, I will do that. Awesome. Uh, so thank you for joining me today. I really enjoyed having this discussion with you. I hope you can come back for more book table episodes in the future. Thank you. I enjoyed it as well. I just hope I didn't talk too much, but I'm just super hyper enthusiastic about the subject. So um, it's yeah, a, it's a super cool topic. I'm really, I'm really glad that people are going to hear about it. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial by going to audibletrial.com slash thebooktable. The Book Table is a podcast from Backroom Whispering Productions. Our theme music is by Mark Wayne. If you like this podcast, rate us on iTunes, or get in touch with us on Twitter at Backroom Whisper, on Facebook at facebook.com slash backroomwhispering, or by email backroomwhispering at gmail.com. Tune in again next time. Thank you.